Welcome to this uh, much anticipated opportunity to hear from Michael Heinrich. I'm Rebecca. Um, and I was just speaking to one of MR's mentors behind the scenes here recently. And he said to me, Marx is like an ancestor, an ancestor to all decent people who seek to understand the world in order to change it. And we don't worship Marx, but we show him respect as we would to our ancestors. So today we have a special opportunity to witness a conversation between several generations of readers of Marx, between Michael Heinrich and his partners in conversation today, Cordelia, Edward, Nathan, and give it a fresh look. So perhaps you read Marx long ago, but suddenly came to the re realization that but while Marx's words stayed the same, you changed. Or maybe you teach capital and would like to encourage your students to grapple with it directly. And we're looking for a suitable resource to guide their exploration. Or perhaps you're here because you're tired of lying to everyone and you haven't actually ever read Marx's capital. And Heinrich is clear about this. There's no real need to worry about that any longer. This is your chance to um, look at a commentary um, that takes you directly to, to capital and back. So uh, Mike, you know, Heinrich's newest book is called How to Read Marx's Capital. And in the tradition of commentaries on philosophical texts, it's meant to be paged through with capital in hand, specifically this edition, um, the Penguin edition, um, focusing on, in this case, just the beginning chapters with future commentary to come. This is a project that Heinrich mentioned to me in a conversation, we, we'll see what happens. But this book in particular focuses only on the first few chapters of chapters rather of uh, Capital. And so that's what we'll be focusing on today as well. Um, now, one of the things that comes up in the introduction to how to read Marx's Capital is that it's really desirable to read Capital in tandem with other people. Um, he recommends that we join or, or form a reading group. So let's get to it. Um, why are we here and who is here? In addition to Heinrich, we have the co-hosts of Real Abstractions, a podcast about communism and theory, really briefly put. Um, Cordelia and Edward, please say hello for a minute. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, thanks for having us. Very happy to have you here. Happy to be here. And we have Nathan Tankus of the Modern Money Network. He has also been active with the Monthly Reviews Monthly program, Money on the Left, which is an interdisciplinary podcast that reclaims money's public powers for imaginative intersectional politics. We invited them all here today because of their deep familiarity with capital. All three of them reached a large number of young scholars like themselves via their podcasts and writings. And one thing we're particularly interested in today is the resurgence of interest in Marx among younger activists and scholars, where this surge in interest came from and where it's going and what this new interest in reading Marx could mean and has already meant in practice. So to begin with, grounding us in everyday practical realities, Michael, I would personally love to know when you started writing this book in Germany years ago, because this is a translation that has recently come out in English, but it was originally published years ago in Germany. What was going on in the world and how did that in part prompt this intervention and what has changed since then? Now that this book is being released in English, what has changed in terms of who is reading Marx and why they seem to be reading Marx in the time between your writing of the book in, in German and its release in English? Um, in German, the book had uh, two parts. The first part appeared in 2008 and the second part in 2013. And when you think back uh, in 2008, it was uh, the time of the financial crisis uh, which came out and uh, a crisis which was rather unexpected for bourgeois uh, economics. And even in, um, in conservative uh, media or conservative journalists discussed uh, that maybe Marx was not so completely wrong as uh, they always told us. And there was more interest in, in capital. It was in, in this year that in Germany uh, for some time, the standard edition of capital was even outsold. Uh, because there was such uh, a demand. What are your thoughts on the ways that people have tried to apply Marx in their everyday lives and everyday strategies as activists in the time leading up to the writing of your book? Capital is absolutely necessary. Marx's capital is absolutely necessary, but never, but never enough. 
you all almost always have to to transcend uh, capital and you also sometimes have to to read it in a in a critical uh, thing in a critical way um, not as a holy text where you presuppose that everything is correct um, you always have also to to check what you can need what is uh, important and uh, in, in the moment, for example, in, in Germany, but I think also in um, the US, one of the dominating uh, political issues is climate change. And related to climate change, uh, we have a lot of uh, persons, groups who tell us something about green capitalism, a capitalism without growth, which uh, in the long run can uh, handle the climate change. Um, using Marx's analysis of um, capitalism, of, of capital, I think um, we can find very strong arguments against such a kind of green capitalism, that uh, there are basic structures opposing to, to the possibility of such a green uh, capitalism. And when you bring these uh, arguments in the debate, then you are at once in, in the center of the most uh, important uh, political discussions we have in the moment. And in so far, nevertheless, that Marx argued on a rather abstract level 150 years ago, we can use him to come in the center of, of uh, contemporary uh, debates. All right, so um, let's take this as an opportunity to bring in our three young scholars, Michael. Um, so Cordelia, Edward, and Nathan, um, let's begin the wider conversation. In terms of the, the reception of, of like uh, capital in Germany, like we said, um, the, I think, uh, sort of contemporary reception of the United States and like in the Anglophone world, um, that always sort of happens after in the aftermath of a crisis. And I think part of that is, of course, the way that capital still gets read as ultimately an economic kind of text. So any sort of economic crisis there is, we go to it as something that's going to explain the economic phenomenon going on. Um, but I, I think in terms of like, you know, obviously the climate crisis and all these other things that are still going on around us, um, it's one of the great things about, about um, I think actually this, this book in particular is it's going to, uh, it does, it's already out. It argues for a, a much more relevant, like you said, very, uh, Marx is our contemporary. Um, reading of Marx, which which is not just sort of economic thing we have to read to figure out what just happened, but it's something that's going to guide us politically uh, in in a more serious direction. As much as uh, Capital is is uh, a timeless text in the sense that its form analysis apprehends uh, enduring concepts of capitalism, um, I was curious how uh, you might make the the pitch to a politically organized. Um, reading group, uh, study group, group of friends, um, why they should take the time and effort to go through capital with the kind of uh, precision that you do um, in your book, especially given the kind of um, common sense uh, dismissal maybe of some of the finer grain parts of what's happening in capital as, as you know, tables and tables of, of linen production coefficients um, and uh, a kind of like folk reading of the, the political dimensions of capital as being limited to something like a, a kind of moralistic Ricardian critique of exploitation. It's like there's a crisis and everybody's like, I guess we'll read Marx again, uh, as if we couldn't read him at any other time, as if he isn't relevant all the time as you know, to our political struggles, to, to everything else that goes on in the world. Um, uh, but I would say, that in terms of this um, this insistence on on reading in groups and really interrogating what he says, uh, one of the things that I, I keep having to 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 highlight in um, talking about this book with other people is they they see the title and they you know it's how to read and they kind of get taken aback like I know how to read you know just left to right you know just open start with page one so they they treat it as if this is some sort of you know like ABCs or something but uh, I, I I get this this impression and um and I think you even say this actually in your preface that it's it's not just learning how to read in general but learning the importance of interrogating Marx uh, and and doing it in this way 
Um, and uh, I, I'd, I'd love to hear more, more about that and, and the importance of that. Because I'm actually, so with the release of this book, I'm doing my own capital group um, that I put a link out or a, you know, a thing out for. I said, if you want to just do this with me, uh, with this text, just let me know. And I'm now at like 300 people in a, in a server somewhere that are all telling me that they're going to read this book with me. I expect like 20 of them to show up. But, um, you know, because that's the way that goes. But uh, I would love to, to have a better idea of what you mean by that. And if you have any tips for doing that in larger groups on the off chance that I have 300 people all trying to interrogate this text with me. I have to rem a remark about uh, not how to read capital, but how to use my commentary. A commentary in some respect is a dangerous book. When you read the commentary first, then you have in mind what the commentator says, it reads very plausible. And with this framework, then you go to the commented book and of course you will recognize everything what the commentator said. Therefore, I recommend very strictly read first a few pages or a paragraph in capital write down your questions, uh, your, your, the problems you see with the text, and only after this, read the corresponding part of my commentary, uh, so that you are not overwhelmed by, by the commentary, but that you also can have a critical look on, on the commentary and say, okay, I have problems here, but Heinrich doesn't say anything to this, and what he says, does it really fit? So you, you should not only be have a, a critical attitude to capital, you also should have a critical attitude to my commentary. The second point I, I have to stress, I, I wrote in, in the introduction of the commentary, there are two very different ways of commenting. There is the commentary of the everything knowing commentator, uh, a commentator who, who uses everything, who seems to know everything, explaining and the reader is overwhelmed from all this uh, wisdom. This is basically a very problematic uh, way to comment. A much better uh, way to comment would be to use only the text in question so that uh, you shouldn't rely on other texts which the reader of capital doesn't know. Unfortunately, you cannot follow this second line always. Sometimes maybe in capital there is a hint of Adam Smith, then you have to say something about Adam Smith or uh, something what Marx wrote is a um, consequence of a change in his former text, uh, maybe the, the first edition of Capital, you also have to mention this. So you cannot exclude that you use more material than just the text you, you need. But um, what I tried in my commentary to make very clear on which level we are. When I uh, use things which are not immediately in, in the text under discussion, I put to my commentary addendum as a, as a title. This addendum also in, in, um, appears in, in different um, letters in a, in a different uh, typographical um, picture. So it is very clear for the reader on which level of commentary uh, we are. And this is the basic how to use the commentary. But now how to read capital. Um, in the first, the first uh, paragraph of the first chapter, who read capital, you all can remember this, uh, the wells in, um, God, now I, in German, I, I know it by heart, but not in, in, in English, this um, sentence that uh, in, in societies in which capitalist mode of uh, production prevails, uh, wealth takes the form of appearance of a big collection of um, commodities. This sentence seems rather 
easy to understand. And the second sentence says, and therefore our um, research starts with the single uh, commodity. This seems very easy to understand. I use in my book uh, two or three pages of commentaries just to these five lines in order to make clear nothing is easy. There are implicit um, differences. When Marx speaks of societies in which capitalist mode of production prevails, then implicitly he distinguishes between societies without capitalist mode of production, uh, societies with capitalist mode of production, but it is not prevailing, and societies with prevailing uh, um, capitalist mode of production. And only about these societies we talk. So already in the first sentence, you can learn that discussing money and commodity in the first three chapters is not discussing a kind of pre-capitalist mode of production. It is discussing capitalist mode of production, but in the very first step with abstraction from capital, because you can at the beginning not talk about everything. So I try to show what is in such a, a sentence which looks very easy. And then I criticize the way Marx continues when he says, and therefore our uh, research starts with the single um, commodity. This is not really a reasoning. Even if we can agree that um, the wealth appears as, a, um, appears as a collection of commodities. Why is commodity the starting point? Why not money? Why not wealth? Why not use values? So Marx, in, in this, this second sentence, give us not really a reason why he starts with the commodity. He just tell us that he himself had a certain thought, he, he thinks it's rational, and we have to wait, we have to follow the, the arguments, and then we can check if this was a good idea or not. So we also have to, to uh, in, in this question, how to read capital, we have to check what is really included in a sentence, what is a real justification for the next argument, and what is just an, an, a kind of empty place which has to be filled later in the argumentation. Nowadays, people say, yes, climate change is a big problem, and we have to, um, to do something. We have also to do some uh, economic changes, uh, maybe, the, the companies should produce uh, more in accordance with uh, the necessities of uh, preserving climate and uh, maybe even reduce uh, growth so that we not um, use so much resources and uh, produce so much um, uh, toxic things and so on then uh, usually they have an idea of companies which mainly uh, produce in order to satisfy needs. Okay, the producers also want to earn some money, but the main thing is to satisfy needs. And this is the first thing we can learn from Marx, that capitalist production has nothing on has the satisfaction of needs, not as any central uh, uh, point. Needs are only satisfied when there is enough money to pay for the satisfaction. And what the, the producers, the capitalist producers want is not just gaining money, getting money in order to, to cover the costs they want to maximize profit. But profit maximizing is not an expression 
of uh, an individual greediness that capitalists are somehow crazy persons who want to, to, to make profit, profit, profit. Maybe such persons exist, but this is not uh, the relevant point. The relevant point is that capitalism is organized in this, this uh, competition on markets that the single capitalists need to increase their profits in order to survive at the market. And this brings, this, this enforces a certain structure, profit maximizing, um, mostly uses new technology in order to, uh, uh, to, to uh, decrease the costs of the single unit which is produced. But this new te technology in most cases only decreases the unit costs when the number of units is um, extended. And in so far gross, it is not an aim of capitalist production, but it is a kind of collateral from profit maximizing and profit maximizing is, um, it, it is forced by the way capitalism is organized and must be organized. So when you understand these interconnections, it becomes clear that you cannot say, oh, capitalism, okay, basically it looks nice, but I want to change this element and this facet, and then we live in, in a wonderful world. No, you cannot change every facet in the way you you would like to change it and this when when this is not possible but when the problems like uh, climate change are so big then we must discuss what are the alternatives to capitalism it's it's a, a necessity to to discuss this it's it's not a, a moral point it's not that uh, you must wish this it is a necessity when you are confronted with certain problems and to understand this and that you are able to to translate this also in in uh, in a public discussion the study of capital can help Now you, you did uh, a very long sequence from um, capitalism, revolutionary subject, revolutionary moments, disruption of production, which nearly every step of your sequence, I would question. Um, revolutionary subject, um, what usually uh, leftists and also Marx for sometimes did this, what, what they do with this, to me, it sounds uh, like uh, looking for the, uh, now I forgot the English term, this um, in al alchemy, this stone which can transform every element in, in the other uh, elements. The revolutionary subject for, for many leftists is such an entity when we could find this, then we can do everything. But unfortunately, it is so hidden or it is sleeping or it doesn't hear our call. And uh, so we don't know what to do. I think a revolutionary subject you only have in a revolutionary situation, then it constitutes. And after the, the, this revolutionary situation, it disappears. So to, to look now, oh, what is the the revolutionary subject, uh, I think it is um, a wrong question. We have to look on, on real fights, of course, with very different groups. Some groups uh, which sometimes were expected they would be revolutionary subjects, they are not. Others who, where, where we didn't have this expect, expectation uh, become active. So. History is a much more open uh, process than in, in this idea with the, the revolutionary subject. Change, also when we, when we talk about fundamental change like abolishing capitalism, cannot 
be reduced to the single point. Now there is the moment, either revolution, either nothing. No, um, capitalism is changing every day. It is on the one hand adjusting, it is uh, the most flexible uh, mode of production we ever saw in history. It also has the, the ability to include a lot of contradicting oppositional uh, forces, but also it can change um, in, in, the, um, in the field of power. Capitalism, the, the capitalist mode of production can extend and it can shrink. Just to, to give one example, it has nothing to do with the climate change, but uh, it's very practical here in, in Berlin. We have a big uh, housing problem. Rents are exploding. Uh, even um, middle-class families with a good income have problems to, to finance a proper uh, apartment. And Berlin is not the worst city in, uh, in Germany. Munich is, is even much more expensive. And in elections at the uh, end of uh, September, we also can decide about a referendum where the referendum says the Berlin government, not the, the government of the federal state, but the, the government of the state of Berlin should start measures to confiscate the apartments of big housing companies which own more than 3000 apartments. Already that we discussed this, that this became a serious discussion confiscating of these uh, housing companies is a political change. We discuss about the question of property, which sectors of the economy we have to take away from capitalism in order to, to make it possible for ordinary people to, to have their lives. This is not uh, an abolishing of capitalism, but if such uh, something happens in this direction, it would be an important step to limit capitalism. And then of course the fight has to go further. And we, we already see with this uh, small step, there is a lot of resistance from bourgeois politics, from, from the housing companies, also from, from other companies, but because they fear uh, we will not stop with the housing companies. And I must admit, they are right. If this is a success, of course, why we should stop? We, we will go further. So there is a continuous fight. Uh, it can conclude in, in, a his, in, a, in a revolution and then we will have a revolutionary subject. But even long before this moment, it is a very important um, Fight. And in so far, um, talking about the limitations of capitalism, the, the, the limits we have to put on it, um, we must not at once uh, start some, in my view, metaphysical discussion about uh, revolutionary uh, subjects. Already from the very first sentence, in a sense, begins with um, this sort of bizarre world that we live in. Uh, against uh, an alternative outside of it, um, and that there's a political thread which can be teased out of it throughout of domination. Cordelia, did you want to jump in? On the same note, um, apropos of the talk of climate change and housing struggles in um, earlier, I actually wanted to play devil's advocate for a second. I, I was curious how in particular you might uh, respond to maybe um, one of the social democratic folks listening in, um, uh, a post Keynesian, what have you, who says that these issues like climate change and housing respectively um, are basically ones of either um, externalities not being taken into account or issues with investment coordination. Because you, you, see, uh, you, you see a lot of, um, everyone agrees from the, the center of, politics down to the left, um, that climate change and, and, you know, pablum about housing affordability are pressing issues. 
Um, but I was curious how in particular uh, you would say what um, you would articulate what capital might have to say to someone who says, well, you know, the easy solution, considering the, the wonderful uh, economic development that capitalism has brought us, um, would be, you know, a, we're going to do a Pagovian tax on carbon to capture the real social cost of it. And we are going to do better investment coordination um, in something like the housing sector. Okay, now um, it's an interesting uh, theme. Um, it goes a little bit of, um, away, at least from the, the starting uh, chapters of Capital, uh, when we have read uh, all three volumes, especially volume three, we are more close to this. Um, I am very skeptical as well against concepts who want to, um, to impose the real social cost, uh, like the, the costs, uh, um, um, got this um, trade with, with emissions, that the CO2 is, is somehow taxed or, or gets a price. Um, I think it is a very fictitious um, idea that you can um, get the real social cost of something and make this a, a market price. I think uh, when, when you add you like this, uh, you have a rather fantastic idea of, um, of markets. And um, similarly, it is this investment coordination. Uh, investment coordination is not the problem. The problem is what is the aim? Is the aim profit maximizing? Then capital is doing the best uh, uh, capital, uh, investment coordination. Or do you have uh, the aim really to uh, satisfy the needs of, of uh, ordinary people with low income. And then you must break the investment coordination of capital. Then you need, at least in a, in a kind of, uh, as well you have, um, as long as you have uh, capitalism, maybe you can do something with the public sector that you invest tax money for housing, let us say, but what is not oriented to the aim of, um, um, of profit maximizing. This also someday will reach a limit because the tax comes from the capitalist uh, part of the economy. And then usually there is an attack on this public sector in a crisis in order to, to improve internet, the, the international competitiveness and, and so on. And there is only, the only solution is then to go one step further. So you, you cannot have a kind of balance of a public sector, of a private sector, of a public coordination of investment and a private in, uh, um, uh, uh, coordination. It is more an, an ongoing fight, which must have as the last aim to abolish capitalism. And I say this not because I would like to abolish capitalism, what I do, by the way, but this is not the main point. It, it doesn't work to say, oh yes, now let's have a nice public sector with uh, Keynesian uh, um, economic policy and the rest is for the capitalists and maybe they also can deliver something nice. Uh, this will not work uh, in the long run. And in so far, uh, I don't see at least a, a long run perspective in, in um, Keynesian economic policy, investment coordination, or this real social cost models, which try to, to make the market better. Um, I think all these are dead ends. Well, I mean, I would, the one thing I would poke at, I, I agree with a lot uh, that was said there, but one thing I would poke that is that 
the kind of dealing with the real social costs kind of point of view is a like post Keynesian or not Keynesian, whatever term you want to use point of view. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of that right now of talking about, you know, uh, you know, having either a carbon tax to, you know, get a price of carbon or trying to reconstruct a carbon price out of some sort of other mechanism, say financial regulation or, or the like. But I think, um, you know, a lot, I think more on, I think an area where I think there's probably some convergence in the middle, at least between um, certain Marxist perspectives and, you know, left Keynesian or post Keynesian or MMT point of views or, or whatever, um, is that the focus is precisely on you need to reduce carbon emissions directly. And that's, you know, a direct conflict that you need that, that you need to take on. Um, that you, you know, obviously, you know, there, you know, whenever anyone is proposing a policy, they're proposing policies that are about keeping carbon in the ground. But I think there's much more awareness that this is, you know, a political conflict that is more and more dire all the time and that you need to win a, a political f a fight that is always ongoing until you kind of over overcome capitalism or, you know, overcome these industries that have, you know, trillions of dollars in assets. Even, you know, people who talk more about economic policy terms, you get comparisons between, um, you know, basically a lot of what we're talking about in terms of uh, by keeping oil on the ground is expropriating oil companies. I mean, you're interfering with their property rights when you say they can't pump oil out of the ground or when you tell a company that they uh, can't produce X, Y, or Z um, with uh, a certain amount of carbon emissions. So I think there is some kind of meaning in the middle and the, there are some people who are still focused on carbon taxes and real prices of carbon through um, imposing some money prices. But I think as, as the situation of climate change is getting more and more dire, and especially in the context of coronavirus, which we actually haven't really talked about uh, yet, uh, where we're seeing, you know, fights over direct regulations and interfering directly in how companies function, that the kind of trying to mess with companies' incentives through prices um, is becoming less and less an influential kind of point of view, whether you are, you know, on the revolutionary left or more broadly a Marxist left or um, kind of traditionally, conventionally more so, uh, um, more social democracy inclined or more policy inclined or whatever it is. There's a lot more that I could say or could, we could go into, but just wanted to poke out a little thing, which may be, you know, um, an odd angle where I might not be seeing things the way other people are seeing that, but that's at least how I've seen the conversation evolve over the coronavirus crisis in terms of climate change. Michael, do you have a response to that, or would you like to? Yeah, um, okay, not not real uh, response. I I agree that uh, the question of um, expropriation of of companies, of direct regulation, of direct intervention, already is uh, on the table. Um, but I think the the big difference is also to, to Keynesian uh, economists and, and uh, politicians with such an orientation that they basically believe in the strength of the market, that this is our basic structure, okay, it needs a little bit uh, improvement here, a little bit regulation there, and then we can, um, we can go forward. And also a lot of leftists um, have the idea that uh, a socialist economy would be a kind of market socialism. And here I'm extremely skeptical when I have in mind uh, what Marx was uh, analyzing that markets, when, when they are really um, include everything when, when a market is not only 
a very limited thing like it was, for example, in ancient uh, societies. But when the whole economy is uh, organized with markets, that then you have a strong tendency to a capitalist market. This is, uh, there, there is not a, a kind of all including non-capitalist market. And when you have a capitalist market, then you have, of course, the, all the problems with crisis, with uh, destruction of, of the environment uh, and so on. In so far, from my, my reading of Marx, I would take a strong non-market orientation. I know that, of course, we cannot abolish markets tomorrow, even if we would have a kind of revolution and, and would take, uh, could take political power. You cannot say, okay, guys, from tomorrow on, everything is different. But I think it makes a big difference if you have this basic, this fundamental critic against markets in mind, and then you discuss when, what can we do uh, in, in the um, situation in the moment, or if you have in mind, market is not so bad, we just have to improve it. And this, I think, is a politically, it's, it's a very important point. To us vantage point, I think, there's more of a right-left split along yeah. the lines of you're talking about um, in terms of people who are otherwise influenced or interested in Keynesian or post-Keynesian ideas or MFT ideas, whatever. I think there's more of a split, which might not be a split that's emerging in, in, in Germany, which obviously has a much more long-standing uh, Keyn like Keynesian influence in, you know, in gov among politicians, among not, that is sort of like, been disappeared and then sort of uh, vaguely rediscovered in bits and pieces in the U.S. in the last few years. So as a result, I think there's sort of a right-left split where there are there are the kind of you know more mainline Keynesian economists or old post-Keynesians that you're talking about, um, but there's a lot of younger people who are still interested in Keynesian or post-Keynesian ideas, whatever in some fashion, that are also kind of more about direct regulation and direct conflict and making spaces outside of markets for democratic coordination of, of, of production and consumption. Um, and I think I'll throw in and then hand it back to Cordelia. Well, I'm always curious to hear more about uh, what folks have to say about um, quote unquote democratic coordination of production and consumption, especially apropos of what, what Marx talks about um, with regards to free association and social planning. But I think to, uh, to keep it within um, capital a little, uh, I wanted to raise a, a specific question, um, which sort of fits into this discussion between um, the guide and uh, post-Keynesianism, et cetera. Um, I was interested in, in reading the book um, that you, Michael, make the point that Marx's argument against the quantity theory of money with regards to metallic money, um, contrary to what Marx himself says, also holds for paper money as well. Um, I know Nathan here does a lot of work in and around modern monetary theory. Um, and I was curious what, um, if anything, uh, you think that this uh, kind of corrected version of Marx's um, theory of the money forum in chapter three and four might have to say to um, post-Keynesian modern monetary theory types. Yeah. Okay. This now, now, uh, until now we were on a rather general level of discussion. Now we become a little bit more specific about Marxian uh, categories. Um, of course, in in uh, my my book, it's a commentary. On, on capital, it's not an, an essay, not a monography. However, uh, I also had to, to stress points where Marx's arguments are not so convincing or becoming wrong looking to the um, historical development. Marx in cap capital presupposes a so-called money commodity 
that like it was in, in former centuries, that gold or silver is the money. And paper money just represents the gold, uh, a certain amount of gold or, or silver. So the, the, commodity, the money commodity itself, it is not necessary that it circulates, but what circulates, the paper has a very strong relation to this. When we look now to, to the money system uh, in, in uh, the last uh, quarter of the uh, 20th century and uh, in, in the contemporary moment, um, there is no money commodity. There are, I know there are some people who try to construct and to, to argue, oh, gold is still the money commodity. Gold has a, a money price, yes, but Winnegar has also a money price. Uh, this is not enough that something has a money price to say this is the money commodity. I would say today we have a, a money system which is not dependent on a money commodity and the question the first question is when we discuss marx uh, does this lead to a certain damage of marx theory i would say no um, because when you read really carefully um, chapter one where the money commodity plays a crucial role marx never justifies it he just take it as given and shows what this means for uh, form analysis. So it is not really in, in some respect proved that uh, commodity production, commodity circulation needs this money commodity. What is proved by, by Marx is that we need a general form of value. And when this general form is associated to a certain commodity, Marx calls this the money commodity. But the question is, must this uh, general form of value really associate it to a commodity, or can it also um, be associated to a symbol? And here is my argument, this is not precisely Marx, this is a, a kind of, of interpolation on, on my side. Uh, what is this general form of value representing? It represents value as such, but value as such doesn't exist. So you can only use a symbol to represent something what is not a uh, an empirical thing, uh, what exists. Marx gives in the first edition of Capital and a very nice example uh, dealing with general form of value. He says, when you consider money and commodity, it is a little bit like a very special zoo where you have the uh, certain animal species, tiger, elephant, dog, and then as an individual, you have also the animal. But of course, the animal doesn't exist. There is only, this is now my continuation of Marx's uh, example, it is not Marx. When, you, when the animal should exist in this zoo, there are only two uh, possibilities. Either one animal counts simultaneously as the animal, let us say the lion is not only the lion, it counts also as the expression of the animal. This is the case with uh, a gold uh, uh, as money commodity, or you use a symbol, you have a poster with a big A printed on it, and this poster represents the animal. And then you can argue following certain lines of volume three where Marx is dealing with the credit system that the money commodity is even an obstacle for capitalist um, development. Marx brings the, the examples from the Bank of England when there is no crisis, the, the treasury of gold 
is useless in, in the Bank of England. And when there is a crisis, it's an obstacle because this treasury is too small. So it is not really functional fired money, what came after Marx times, we can conclude, it's not the conclusion of Marx, but I think we can conclude just going on the road he already started, that fired money, which is not connected with uh, a money commodity, is much uh, more uh, functional for capital in so far. I would even say this is one point where Marx lost the track of this ideal average of capital. In order to speak about this ideal uh, average, capitalism must be developed to a certain degree. And Marx wrongly believed that in uh, the, the capitalist monetary system is already so developed that after the money commodity, nothing, uh, not, not a new basic step will come. And this was wrong. In so far, my conclusion is money commodity belongs not to the ideal average of capitalist mode of production, but fired money belongs to it. But this has consequences. Fired money also needs the central bank. So you must have a uh, a, commodity, a, a, a credit system with a central bank with a certain role of the state. And this was exactly the problem Marx was confronted in the 1870s. When we talk about these issues uh, regarding Marx, we always should have in mind that the manuscript for volume three was written in the year 64, 65, even before the manuscript of volume one. But Marx's research went on. And in the second half of the 1870s, he realized in, in the, from the situation in Europe that a new form of crisis emerged, the long-lasting stagnation crisis. And this long-lasting stagnation crisis had a certain um, connection with the banking system, with the international banking system. So he became very clear about to analyze such kind of crisis, we need a deeper uh, research of the credit system and of the international system, the world market. We cannot exclude this. And when Danielson, the, the Russian translator, pressed him when the second and the third volume of Capital will appear, when, when you are ready with the manuscript so that I can start to, to translate, Marx wrote in a letter from um, 1878, oh, I cannot finish this capital until this crisis will reach its top. Only then I can study um, what is connected with this. So Marx had a conscious uh, that his analysis was not finished, not finished in an empirical sense. This is never finished but not finished in a, in a theoretical sense, that the, um, the way he was working, he was developing categories is not finished. And this we should have in mind when we discuss nowadays uh, about capital, especially regarding money and the credit system. What we read as volume three, is just the Marx state, he, he reached mid 60s in his excerpts and in his letters from late 60s, from 70s, it becomes clear that his, his concepts developed more, but he didn't manage to, to write this down. It is not somewhere hidden, it is just, there, there are such, just hints in which direction we could do, but this must be our job. We, we must uh, continue this. And so far, coming back to my commentary, I can do a commentary to the beginning of uh, Capital, but I would say a commentary to the third volume of Capital in some respect is not possible 
such a com commentary would at least in the section on, on uh, credit and banking system, at once become a research project and not anymore a, a commentary. I'm sure you have many thoughts about this. Do you wanna respond? Yeah, well, actually, I'm actually just gonna say a, a brief thing because uh, Heinrich sort of anticipated what my question would be, which I think he got into in terms of his discussion of uh, you know, what, what form of money uh, predominates in the ideal average uh, in, in, in Marx's consumption. Because one thing I was thinking about, uh, again, something I've thought about a long, time, a long time, but was thinking about again, uh, reading how to read Marx's capital is um, the idea that you know, not so much capital being wrong or right, because that's both boring and misses the point, but more, um, if you were going to redo it, and of course that's a very fraught question, but in, from one specific angle in terms of um, the discussion of money and uh, and capital, and that you know the idea that capital goes from the most abstract down to the most concrete, or at least starts on the road down to the most concrete, that instead of starting with a money commodity, starting with a kind of not even starting with banking, or I would say even central banking. Um, but just sort of starting with a basic fiat money in one area, one monetary area, we don't even need, need to necessarily call it a country um, per se. Um, and starting from that basics to explore, you know, commodities as um, the cell uh, and, and build up to, uh, you know, build up to banking and even build up to the money commodity is one <clears throat> important historical concretization um, in that, you know, th that being, you know, if there was, you know, obviously, you know, there's no possible way to actually do it. It's sort of just like a thought experiment to think through capital, but that is one major way in which Marx was of his time. And then a different approach would be treating fiat money in one monetary area as the most abstract and then treating things like the money commodity and a global system of, of currencies as the most concrete manifestations. So, a comment or a question. Okay, when, when, when I uh, understood you correctly, you, you mean one, one could um, reverse the, the way of, of presentation. Um, my idea is a little bit uh, different and more, um, uh, coherent um, <laughs> uh, presentation would be on this level of commodity and money, what Marx calls the surface, the abstract surface of capitalist uh, production, that there we cannot uh, deal with the question, what is the real bearer of the money form? So the, the question commodity money, not commodity money, is not at all to, to discuss on the, the level of the first three chapters. There we have just to do with the forms. And of course, the form need a bearer, which, which bears the form. But we cannot say anything about the bearer. And then when we come to, to the third volume, to the credit system, we can come closer to, to this question. And there we in any case have to to go back uh, this is also a, a possibility to to answer to a, a remark from edward uh, long ago in this discussion mm -hmm. you asked about volume two uh, volume two is from the content crucial also for the credit system because uh, the volume two shows that in the usual capitalist pro, uh, process of production and reproduction, on the one hand, um, treasuries emerge, and on the other hand, treasuries are needed. And because the, the category of credit is missing, this process on the level of volume two cannot discuss on, on um, uh, the sphere of, of credit and banking. When in the third volume, we have the fitting categories, 
Then afterwards, after the section on, on um, uh, the interest bearing capital credit and so on, then we should take again in view the process of capitalist production and reproduction. So we, we should talk about what, what we already saw on a certain level on volume two. This would be the more concrete surface then. On, in the first three chapters, we have the absolute abstract surface. Section um, volume two presents the unity of production and uh, circulation of capital, what is in some respect also a kind of surface, but much, much richer surface. And um, this surface only can discuss after um, interest bearing capital and so on from volume three. So you have to go back to all these uh, issues. And this, I think, um, would be my answer to, to Nathan. It's not from fiat money to commodity money, but from the form of money to fiat money as what is according to, to the ideal average. And then you could have an excursion to explain, yes, and commodity money was a not fully developed form uh, of, of fiat money because, because you couldn't have fiat money and therefore um, uh, commodity money was a kind of um, emergency tool or, or something like this. So, the, but I, I agree the overall uh, structure of, of the presentation would be hit by, by regarding these problems. And I think Marx was in some respect um, clear that this is necessary. Um, Engels published the manuscript of 64, 65. This was the only thing he could do. And I, I don't want to, to accuse Engels. He, he did the best he could do, but I'm absolutely sure that Marx, if he would be fit and, and live longer, he never would publish this manuscript in such a form. The, the volume three would look rather different. So you sort of actually already an anticipated a question I had um, when you talked about the impossibility of a, of a companion to, uh, to volume three. Um, but there's also sort of like a, and even, even the kind of classic, I think, uh, thing that we sort of have, have had for a while, which is like David Harvey's companion. See, volume three isn't really even a companion to volume three. It's just tacked on to the volume two companion, um, pretty much starting right after the rate of profit stuff. Um, but I was wondering if, if um, on the one hand, like, is there any future plan to continue? I know obviously the importance for you of, of clarifying the beginning chapters. I want to I want to keep you writing books for the rest of your life, okay? Um, but if there's anything, because for for me especially, like talking about the um, the the not just the like uh, the tendency to go to capital as an economics text, but also the the stubborn historical tendency to to produce like eco economistic readings of it. I often I think actually just tend to stem from the chapters after you and your com your companion here. Um, it's been very frequently like I mean even in terms of like the volume two volume three stuff which is obviously interesting to Nathan that's kind of where uh, the post Keynesians like to live especially in volume two. Um, volume one though even after chapter chapter seven you start getting all the stuff about machinery and the working day and all of a sudden there's like math and stuff. Uh, whereas, you know, Joan Robinson says we're going to dismiss the, the chapter one stuff because, you know, labor theory of value is metaphysical, that kind of thing, that a lot of time is spent on the later chapters, um, which I think maybe could use some clarification in that sense, because then you, you, uh, you get around that tendency to read it that way, which is, I, I think, been so, so stubborn. But I, I would also say then that the, the open-endedness of Marx's project that you had highlighted, uh, the, the research project of, like, you know, uh, the theory of money and credit that would just need to be done. Um, uh, that also, I, I think, would, would play into that, too. You, you have talked about in the past in terms of like the, uh, the, the falling rate of profit uh, stuff. There's a footnote that gets added into the volume in volume one, uh, which is a little handwritten note on the margins of, of Marx's own copy, uh, things like that, that would uh, I would love to see teased out. Um, uh, and then even just outside of that, what are the the for you, what is left open-ended even by the, the companion that you've left us? What's, uh, what is politically pressing? What research projects should that look like for us 
um, not just as as you know readers of Marx, but especially important to um, to 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 me and I know Cordelia as well. This is one of the things, but to to communists, what we take from this. Um, okay, at the beginning you asked uh, if I have plans to to extend this commentary. Um, the commentary is already extended. Um, the book I published in 2008 in, in German was a commentary to the first two chapters and uh, the first uh, four appendices uh, were, were put together. This was the, the first volume. And then I learned, okay, it would be good to, to continue a little bit, uh, especially chapter three is so underestimated and capital. Okay, so I decided to continue until chapter seven, but I definitely don't want to write uh, 20 volumes commentary on three volume uh, capital. And this would be the effect because you have to think, um, the um, volume two and three, what we know usually in Engels edition is not identical with Marx's manuscript. And uh, the difference is, is more than just a formulation. It's not only a question of style. Um, and I, I wrote already in about these problems. So the, the texts you, you have to consider to comment would be much more, um, much more extended, much more uh, difficult. And it wouldn't be a commentary for, um, for a beginner. Um, in so far, I think very probably I will not continue this commentary. I also have a certain trust in, in readers. Uh, a commentary is like you take a child at your hand and, and you lead it. But there must be a point where you can let the hand of the child and the child can, uh, can walk uh, by, by herself. And this must also count for the reader. I, I said at the beginning, I want also to show how to read and then you should do it um, by yourself. In so far, um, maybe I will do research on, on texts. What is missing in MEGA, in, in the big Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, are a lot of excerpts. Marx, for example, at the end of uh, the 60s, impressed by the British crisis from 66, studied extensively literature on money markets. And uh, I think also this changed his views. After this, he decided for volume three, not to take the British banking system as the empirical model for his theory, but the US American, because he argued they develop much quicker than uh, the British system. At, but this would mean not only to have a different um, uh, empirical basis, it would also question what Marx wrote in, in preface to uh, volume one, that England is the locus classicus uh, of, of capitalism. Maybe there is not one locus classicus. Maybe there are different roads. And um, for this, I think we will have material to discuss that there is no final answer, at, at least interpreting or commenting Marx. It is problems he, he puts on the table for us and we should um, discuss this. In, you also asked about new insights by the um, biography I'm, I'm writing. Um, this biography becomes uh, more and more extended um, because the, the problems um, are bigger, are more um, complicated than I, I imagined at the beginning. So it will last until I come to volume four of the biography, which will treat this capital and what Marx is doing in, in the 1870s. 
And then I, I hope I can put together on the one hand research I was doing the last years about new texts, uh, new drafts and, and uh, notebooks of Marx together with this biographical um, development. But this is a, a long lasting um, project um, which needs uh, patience, uh, not only from me, it needs um, patience also um, from Alex Locascio, he's in, in the chat, I saw who, who has to translate all this stuff. And also, of course, patience for, for the readers uh, to, to follow this project. Uh, bringing this in a little bit of a different direction um, and ask a, a question that's related to a lot of the questions in the chat, um, which in the beginning of the book, you have a very accessible um, explanation of what Marx means by uh, capital being scientific. And, you know, the, and how it has, it's different than a kind of folk conception of what scientific means or like our modern folk conception of what scientific. So I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that and explain what, what, what Marx means when he talks about capital as a scientific work. Okay, this is uh, a big uh, issue. Usually uh, when you talk about um, capital as a scientific work, uh, people come quickly to questions of method, then we talk about dialectics uh, and all and, and the relation Marx and Hegel. And um, I, I, these are interesting uh, discussions, but I think especially for a beginner and, and this book, How to Read uh, Capital, it, it is uh, designed for beginners. I think it is not so useful to discuss in an, on an abstract level a lot of methodological questions. So I, I used a rather um, simple notion of uh, scientific argumentation at the beginning that uh, the arguments should be clear that uh, when you try to argue in a scientific way, you, you make clear what are your starting points, what is the way you draw conclusions, how you can justify conclusions in order that the reader can check what you are doing. This, uh, I think, is the, the difference uh, to a religious text. A religious text is a revelation and you can believe or not believe and the scientific text tries to do something else. To come more to the details about a method, I think you need the concrete research, the concrete argumentation. Then also we can discuss, discuss what means dialectical presentation. This is also the reason that uh, the the postface to the second edition of volume one, which is usually in the usual uh, editions of Capital, is put at the beginning after the preface comes the postface. I didn't comment systematically because I took seriously what Marx was doing. He did, didn't put this as the, the preface to second edition, he put it as postface. You need to know something about the presentation in order to understand this postface, where then he talks, uh, he, he brings all these famous um, um, remarks about Hegel putting from the head to the feet uh, and so on. So I think this stuff really needs um, an, a level which is not so totally uh, abstract. And in so far, I, I also have problems to, to talk now about because in, in this short time, we can talk only on, on this abstract level. But let me say one point to, to the famous methodological texts of Marx. It is the introduction from 1857 with this idea ascension from the abstract to the concrete and especially the postface second edition with uh, the relation to Hegel. 
both texts are situated in a certain situation. A situation on the one hand of learning, Marx is still a learning person on the one hand, and in a political situation where Marx had to fight against certain attacks. Usually we read them as if these texts are um, contributions to an eternal abstract uh, discussion about method. This already is wrong. We have to put these texts in context. For example, this um, postface uh, to the second edition, the, the remarks about uh, Hegel are an answer to this critic where people said, oh, what this Marx here is doing is um, Hegelian philosophy mixing up with some economics. And even today you can read this uh, accusation, for example, in the biography written by Jonathan Sperber, he exactly says this, uh, Marx capital is the combination of Ricardo's value theory and Hegel's dialectic, but uh, not really uh, something new. In, in the time when this accusation started in around 1870, Hegel was the synonym for not scientific. Some to accuse someone, oh, this is Hegelian, was a kind of um, killing argument. When, when people believed this accusation, they said, okay, it's, it's useless to, to occupy with this guy. It is uh, empty speculation. So Marx, in, in this situation, to, in order to defend himself, he had to fulfill a double uh, task to say, on the one hand, no, Hegel is not so non-scientific as you believe, but he had also to say, I cannot just say, I'm a Hegelian and I just do what, what Hegel did on a, on a different field. So he had to, to say, yes, Hegel had something, but I do something different. And this on, on, a, on a few pages. Of course, this text had to be cryptic, had to be uh, the text in itself like, like a mystery. And now came generations of Marxists and try to, in, to interpret the holy sentences. What means to put from the head to the feet? What means to reverse uh, something? I would say all these are just empty, um, empty notions which shall indicate it's a big problem and I cannot really talk about this problem at this, uh, this place. And this is so also talking about what means science, what means dialectical presentation and so on. We also have to get free from a, a burden of um, historically emerged views which hinder us to understand what Marx uh, was doing. I wanted to... Um bring things kind of back around to where we started a little bit um, and, and ask another question regarding the real world consequences of either misreading Marx or overly extrapolating capital from capital in politically expedient ways. Um, so, you know, how have debates between readers of Marx led to fissures um, between people who otherwise really ought to be coming together, applying Marxist ideas or you know, Marx's <laughs> ideas and theories to their joint strategy, rather than getting lost in the tendency to parse out differences in interpretation. I, I must say, I, I didn't fully uh, understand the question. Um, the, the difference about Marxists and, and persons who, yeah. who read very closely Marx texts or what? Mostly, the, the real question, that was a kind of diversion, but the real question is, what are the consequences of misreading Marx and what are the consequences of the ongoing kind of like endless debates between readers of Marx that lead to fissures such that people start to get so heady about interpreting the text 
that they are drawn away from practical um, work and daily life and applying Marx in daily life and, and lose focus on the you know, necessity of working together regardless of their differences in interpretation of Marx. Okay, I, I have to, to limit um, in both sides. Um, I would say it is an, an illusion to say, oh, let us read Marx very closely, study the, the holy texts. And when we did this for at least 10 or 20 years, then we have the knowledge to, um, to solve any problems. Uh, reading Marx can, can help, but it cannot solve the problems itself. We, we have to do this and reading Marx can help like also reading other authors. Ma Marx is not the only author we, we should read. Uh, for example, we also should read Keynes, not so much for the proposals, but for his analytical efforts, uh, like Marx learned a lot from Adam Smith and David Ricardo, nevertheless that he criticized uh, them. And I think we also can learn a lot from Keynes and the post-Keynesians, nevertheless, we have to, to criticize them. So reading Marx is not the key to everything. And in so far, you should always do uh, both reading Marx, reading other authors, and also being somehow involved in, in political processes, because also there you, you can learn what's, what's going on, how, how people res, uh, perceive something, how they react, how they fight, uh, and so on. On the other hand, um, reading Marx in different ways, having different um, uh, interpretations. For some questions, maybe it has not uh, a very big um, effect. So I, I wouldn't agree if, if someone would say, oh, first, we must continue in all central questions in our view on Marx, and only then we can start to act. Uh, this is obviously nonsense. We, we have to discuss actions and we have to discuss how we, we can um, understand Marx and how does it help to us. So in so far, I, I wouldn't see um, there is such a big difference, or at least it is not necessarily a, a difference to say, oh, reading Marx or acting uh, politically, it has to, to happen simultaneously and again also simultaneously to read other authors, not only Marx. Nevertheless, that I, I recommend so much Marx, but it is not connected with an only, no only. Is there anything that the, the three of you want to add at this point, at this particular moment? You'll have I would, another chance. Go ahead. I would just, you know, uh, keep going with the political element. I mean, the the importance of of reading again, like if you're in a political organization or what have you, going to the text with 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 pressing, you know, matters in mind, uh, and 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 seeing those things just appear in the text because they will. Um, you know, every time I read the text, it's always something new that sticks out to me uh, based on whatever's going on in the world. It's just a very you know living text for that reason. Um, but I, I would also say then that there's an importance in in reading Marx as opposed to I, I definitely agree that we should be reading other authors, we should be reading Keynes, we should be reading um, lots of lots of other people. Uh, but one of the importance important things of, of actually going to Marx and specifically staying with Marx. And I think one thing that um, you know Robert Halbrunner has the this quote that I tend to bring out a lot, which is that he says that you know we return to Marx not because he's infallible, but because he's is inevitable like we just we have to go to him at some point um uh, and i think one of the things that really sticks out to me in terms of, of what he's doing uh is is that we he's there's no way around his critique and also that the importance of of actually reading him in his own terms or trying to as best we can which i think is the strength of your companion is that it brings out those terms or tries to clarify what those terms might be is that we don't risk the political problem of 
having a misunderstanding of what our job ought to be. Um, and that's, I, I think that's been a problem with the left, not just in terms of, you know, Marxists, but in general. And I think one that even Marxists have historically been pretty bad about clarifying when we start getting slogans like, you know, labor is entitled to all it creates or, you know, th those sorts of things where the, the text does do a, a, a good service in grounding us in what our, the obstacles are, the limits of the system are and what we should be doing about it. Um, and so, you know, it, that's one of the reasons why it not only, you know, as relevant to the text, but also that it's relevant to our struggles to make sure that we're constantly going back to, to this, uh, if not the text even, but at least the ideas, uh, because they still uh, need to be, many of us still need to be reminded of, of the, the lessons of those, because otherwise I think we, we just are going to arrive at a political failure. I must say, I cannot say um, very much to, to this. I, I uh, agree with uh, this view and I, I try to, to express something uh, similar. But reading your book, it seems like you're responding to a series of debates um, and and discussions amongst um, people who've written sec secondary interpretations. But you're you're not explicitly naming these different individuals because you don't want, uh, especially beginning readers of Capital, to get lost in those debates. You want them to have their own relationship with Marx. That's my my impression. Um, if this book is a little bit of a corrective for much of the secondary interpretation out there, if that descriptor is accurate, why was there a need for a corrective, especially when it comes to how interpretations of Marxism are applied in practice? So um, just for those of you who, who are familiar with Capital, um, which I think most of this uh, conversation might have required, um, uh, the different things that have come up throughout our conversation, but especially come up in the book is that you know Heinrich engages with some of the misunderstandings resulting from mistranslation and controversies resulting from unquestioning adoption of these secondary interpretations in the absence of actually reading Marx. Um, so for example, beginning with putting to rest the antiquated um, historicizing interpretations of Marx in many secondary texts, um, or in the you know in, in this book, Heinrich also takes on a debate between amongst value theorists, does value arise during the production process itself, or is value created through the process of both production and exchange? In other words, is the value of something inherent in the finite thing created, or is value more intangible and reliant on a process of social exchange? And then there are, as we've talked about today a, a bit, there are the misunderstandings of Marxist thoughts on money. Uh, for those who skip the beginning chapters, they might think that Marx thinks of money as a mere symbol and um, you know, not even understand that Marx thinks of it as a commodity, actually, <laughs> that not only is money a, more than a symbol, it is not an appendage to the exchange process. It underlines, underlies the exchange value. So these are the kinds of things that reading how to read Marx's capital will help you to get clarity on um, as you go through this process on your own with, uh, with the flawed edition <laughs> um, that he recommends in hand. Or if you are able to join Edward's reading group, which I think is probably the best way to go. Um, I think we would all agree that it's better to read um, Marx with others. I hope it's been a rich conversation for everyone. I think for me, it has been. Um, and thank you again, Michael, for joining us to discuss how to read Marx's Capital. And thank you so much to the hosts of Real Abstractions, Cordelia and Edward, and to Nathan Tankus, who is somebody that Monthly Review has a long relationship with. If you, if you would like to be in touch with Monthly Review, feel free to reach us at press at monthlyreview.org. Thank you. Let, let me um, oh, yeah. add one time. Uh, when I understood correctly, Edward is doing a, a capital reading group. Yes. Free and to join. Um, when you um, move uh, forward in, in reading, um, we can also join for a kind of seminar to, to um, uh, discuss some questions. Uh, you just have to tell me what are the discussion points and then it's very easy by Zoom, we have uh, the technical opportunities um, to, to spend together an afternoon discussing the questions of the, the reading group. Yeah, I would love that. Let's do it.